MSP430 that I reverse engineered. This is my device for attacking the MSP430 bootloader. The bootloader itself was not software that was added after the fact. It was actually uh, firmware that ships with every single chip as part of masked ROM. This is a photograph of the ROM that I took with a microscope after removing the package of the chip using fuming nitric acid. Ah, don't go shooting, neighbor. And then also the, um, the depassivization layer and just a hair of the metal layer to add contrast to the image using hydrofluoric acid. And you can see these different columns, each one of which is a bit of significance. It's been a while since I've deciphered these, but if I recall correctly, the, the battery's dead. Okay. The ones on the left are the least significant bit, the ones on the right are the most significant bit, and then within each column, if you pick any given position, that same position within all of the columns will give you a word. By taking a couple of the words and also reading it out of firmware or comparing it against different, sorry, reading it by software or by comparing it to different versions, you can identify where all of the bits reside. But that was the old stuff. The new stuff involves writing a debugger, first for the ChipCon 8051. I'll be discussing how to debug it and how to glitch into it. Uh, I'll be discussing how the protocol works, exactly which bytes you send and which bytes you receive back, uh, as well as a, a as yet unpublished crypto vulnerability that I discovered for Chipcon's Zigbee radio stack. Um, so if any of you have been playing with the smart grid, this lets you guess a session key. I have two 32 kilobyte lookup tables which contain every session key used by one of the most popular stacks, the Chipcon Z stack. Uh, hopefully they'll have that patch soon and the vendors that use that code will patch it soon. Uh, they've already been informed, but so far as I know, there's no patch out yet. Um, I'll also be discussing MSP430 JTAG debugging, which is interesting because it's incompletely documented. The, um, the protocol is out there in the wild. You can get a, a copy, you can get a debugger, you can hook it up to a chip, you can debug that chip and you can watch it with a logic analyzer and you can decipher the, what the words of the instructions mean but they haven't told you the one piece of secret sauce that you need to make a full debugger which is breakpoints. There's nothing in the documentation that describes how to halt on a given instruction or how to halt in, in the software breakpoint which is where you have an instruction that forces a halt. If anyone has this information, I would, love for it appear, I would love for it to appear in my inbox. You would be quite neighborly for doing so. And I'll briefly discuss the Atmel AVR's protocol because I've been working with glitching it using um, these quantitative tests. So I run through a debugging session and during the initialization phase, I will drop the power sharply to a low value and bring it right back up. And I, I keep doing this repeatedly I'm varying the time and the voltage, and I'm also just trying to run it at low voltages to figure out where it fails. The idea is that these two graphs should overlap in some regions. So, uh, for example, there's a, a local minima where the stability of the chip gets really bad at low voltage. It's better at a lower voltage than it is at this one. And I, I've also found that that same point is where the chip is likely to let me skip its debug fuse. So if Mitch was not so neighborly about sharing the firmware to his TV begone and I wanted to extract it forcefully, I could do so by dropping the voltage during the initialization phase when it's actually reading this um, security fuse bit out. Uh, I won't be discussing some of my older projects. Um, and I won't be going over the schematics in detail because they're not that complicated. You have a USB to serial chip talking to an MSP430 microcontroller, which runs custom C code. It has a bunch of digital I.O. pins for talking to digital I.O. pins, and it has a digital to analog converter with 12 bits accuracy that it uses to power the target. Um, you can just write a value into that register and immediately raise or drop the target voltage. Um, in previous lectures, I discussed Zigbee stack overflows for like, actually injecting codes into a running wireless sensor node. I won't be doing that today, but you can find 
the details in my TIDC of 08 lecture, it's the Texas Instruments Developers Conference. Um, I won't be discussing the timing exploit itself, but you should look up those lecture notes and uh, the slides because it's a really neat trick that allows it to work. Uh, or reverse engineering the debugger or hacking a smart meter. And while I'd love to talk about HP28 graphing calculators, I don't have time. So this is a debugger itself. You've got a, a couple of plugs on the front that you run into the target board. On the back, you've got a USB plug or Ethernet, which runs to the host computer. The idea is that it reads, writes, and erases memory. It lets you trace the program counter. So you could do an execution trace of an entire program, single stepping it and recording where it's been so that you know where to optimize. Uh, you can observe registers and you can start and stop on breakpoints. All the things that you would expect a debugger on a PC to do, the only difference is that the device you're debugging is external to the computer. It's running in a box somewhere on your bench, plugged up to things electrically. This is my debugger board, the GoodFet 20. Since then, I came out with the GoodFet 30, which is a cheaper variant. Um, then I found out that there is a global sh shortage of the cheap chip that I used in the GoodFet 30. So the GoodFet 21, which has just now been manufactured, is a descendant of this design, which is more powerful. The chip at the top was used for glitching. It's now irrelevant. All that remains are the chips on the bottom. Um, the one on the left near the USB plug is just an FTDI USB to serial chip. It connects to the MSP430 to its right. It, the 430 has a built-in bootloader, so you can very quickly flash this repeatedly, and you don't need to have firmware loaded into it. So you don't have the chicken and egg problem of already needing a flashed microcontroller just to make a new one, or to make a flasher. Um, JTAG itself is used for a lot more than just the MSP430. It also targets the ARM, the PowerPC, uh, UltraSpark, the, the OpenSpark chips have their own JTAG implementation, and you can run this very powerful CPU through. I haven't played with that chip in detail, but it would be really neat to get execution traces as it breaks them down into superscalar. So uh, on more modern chips, you've got multiple instructions executing in parallel, which is what allows you to get more than one instruction per cycle. You might be able to halt it and then dump the micro operations that come out from that buffer. Um, but the details of how this works are unique to each family. It would not make any sense for the OpenSpark or another superscalar chip to have the same debugging protocol as a 16-bit microcontroller, like the MSP430. So each one is different. And they usually involve just pushing an instruction somewhere into the uh, execution pipeline, or ring in the case of a multi-cycle chip. Um, AVR ISP is a sort of secondary protocol for the Atmel AVR. They allow you to program either by JTAG, which supports debugging, or by ISP, which is only for programming. And then a lot of chips, particularly custom system on a chip devices by radio companies like Chipcon, they create their own debugging protocol, or it comes with the CPU core that they choose. So it, some of these things don't even have names. Uh, the Chipcon 8051 documentation is the debugging protocol of the Chipcon 1110, 1130, 2430, 2530. They just list part numbers in a series because they're so different. Um, we've been over this. Just remember that if you don't build it, you don't really understand it. Um, so the code for this device is split into two fragments. The idea is that anything that needs to be, it needs to have a fast reaction time. If you're trying to read a byte out and make a decision based upon that byte, the USB delay is suicide. And that's why even today you see so many products being shipped for the parallel port. It's because the parallel port has a faster reaction time. This gets around it by having C firmware running on the microcontroller, which speaks to Python on the PC. You begin by writing the lowest level functions in C. This might be as low level as setting a port or clearing a port, writing a byte, reading a byte. And the high-level functions begin in Python and then move down into C, until eventually you have a C function that flashes an entire page of code. And then you can just slam out a large packet through the USB buffer into the, target, or into the MSP430, which actually does the programming with the target. This is how fast programming